Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. All right, so totality and infinity, the conclusions. So in this section, uh, Levinas gives us 12 conclusions. And my plan is basically just to go through each one of those and say a few things about each of them. Um, some of them I have a lot to say about, some of them just a few, a couple of sentences. So we'll just go through them this way, break it down like this. And when we get to the end, I'll give a quick summary of, of all 12, which is going to be the longest summary that I've ever given. In, uh, in fact, it might be the longest summary I've ever given. It's going to span three sections, but um, I think it's going to span three sections. But, uh, but yeah, we'll see how we go. Um, I don't think this will be too long, and maybe no more than, than any other videos anyway. So the first conclusion that Levinas makes, he calls, from the like to the same. And the idea here is that identity does not come from being like to itself. And the idea with that is that in order to be like to itself, this requires an external perspective. So it requires a relation with something else, which would totalize, which would end up being a forming a totality. So Levinas rejects this, this way of thinking about identity as like to itself. Rather, identity comes from being the same. And that's more like identifying oneself from within. So it's just this idea of instead of trying to um, see yourself as being the same as yourself, like to yourself, uh, which which implicitly at least suggests an external perspective. Um, identity comes from being the same, identifying oneself from within. So Levinas's thought is taking us from this this typical way we think about identity from the like to this internal way of apprehending our, our own identity, the same. The second conclusion, being is exteriority. And this is essentially a rejection of an object-centered conception of being. So if, if everything is, is, the focus is on the object, then the subjective becomes an illusion. And this destroys exteriority by absorbing the subject into the exterior. So if we, we get absorbed into the exterior, then there is no exterior anymore. Uh, and this is, I guess this is basically empiricism, right? the idea that the object, the thing, is, is the measure of reality, is what being is. As opposed to, I guess, uh, an idealist or an... Or an um, intellectualist approach, a subject-centered conception of being. And this destroys exteriority by relativizing it in relation to the subject. So a thing is only a thing according to my own projects, according to how I view it, according to, to how it makes sense with reference to me. Neither of these um, admit of genuine exteriority. For Levinas, however, being is exteriority itself. Being is the alterity, absolute alterity, brought about in that face-to-face -face encounter. However, an important aspect of this is that exteriority can only be produced from a radically separated place from what Levinas calls a necessarily subjective field of truth. So there must be an isolated, separated being in order for there to be exteriority, in order for exteriority to, um, to even exist, for, but certainly for it to make sense, for it to be, to be possible. So this subjective field of truth Levinas calls the curvature of intersubjective space. The truth of being is not the image of being, the idea of its nature. 
It is the being situated in a subjective field which deforms vision, but precisely thus allows exteriority to state itself. So there's a couple of things in there. Uh, truth is not an intellection. Being is not an intellection. It's, it's not an, an idea, concept. Truth is not graspable in an image either. either. And this is thinking in terms of vision. So truth is not, not graspable in an image in terms of vision because, uh, because vision relies on um, thematization he, he is the word he uses here. And it means that vision is always vision for, vision for an individual. So I am thematizing things. I'm solidifying something. I'm solidifying what is for Levinas as, as pure exteriority, fundamentally transcendent. I'm attempting to define it and close it in concepts or terms or with reference to me. Um, that's what vision does. That's how vision operates. So truth being is, or the truth of being is not going to be graspable in this way. Uh, the third thing is that the subjective field we're talking about, which is just the individual, the separated individual, the subjective field deforms vision. That's an interesting um, way of putting this. So it deforms it, and I think that, that carries through in, in what Levinas says here, how he describes this as the curvature of intersubjective space. That curvature deforms vision. Um, so it distorts the thematized object of vision. It distorts the object that has reference to me, the object that um, fits into my goals and my projects, that has specific qualities that have meaning for me. It distorts that vision, distorts the thematized object. How? By opening to exteriority by opening to exteriority as a fundamental alterity, as something fundamentally transcendent. And he also notes that this curvature of the subjective cannot be corrected for, which is, is often what philosophy tries to do, right? Get rid of, or it's what science certainly tries to do and what philosophy has often tried to do, get rid of the subjective to, so that we can see reality as it really is. <clears throat> Uncover object, the truth of objective reality, for instance. <clears throat> but the curvature can't be corrected for in this way because the curvature is the very mode in which the exteriority of being is effectuated in its truth. That curvature is the very way we apprehend exteriority. <clears throat> and that is the being, the truth of being. So there's correcting, attempting to correct for this, the subjective field of truth is, is a mistake. And, that, and at, at, the, at best, you'll end up with... Um, an, you know, an objective reality, um, but it, but well, you'll end up with not not the objective reality you think you're, you're you're looking for. You'll end up with what reality is to vision, which is inherently tailored to the subject. It's inherently um, it, it inherently references the subject, which means you're not getting the truth of being. So I quite like those ideas there. That some of those some of those terms, the field of this, the necessarily subjective field of truth, which is what we are, as as separated beings, and that idea that this sets up a curvature of intersubjective space, and, and it's that curvature which which um, is an opening to exteriority, which allows us to to um, apprehend exteriority insofar as that's possible, insofar as exteriority is absolutely transcendent. So anyway, that's the second, the second conclusion, being is exteriority. The third, the finite and the infinite. 
and here um, there isn't much to say about this. Metaphysics is a relation between a finite separation and an infinite alterity. Okay, I mean, as we've talked about the whole book. Um, but he notes that this finitude can't be a longing for infinity. Um, it can't be a, an attempt or a desire to overcome that infinity, to return to some transcendent state of being. Desire, capital D, desire, requires separation. We saw that before, right? The um, exteriority requires a separated subjective field of truth. <clears throat> so without that, so we can't hope to, to get rid of this finitude. It's, an, it's a necessary part of, of the process. And in that vein, finitude is not a negative. It's not less in relation to the more of infinity. It's finitude makes the relation with infinity possible. I really like that, that concept, that notion. It resists this, this tendency to see the physical or the body or... Um, well, really, those just those two things, the physical and the body, as um, somehow less than somehow something we should try and overcome, which is what just about every religion pushes for. And um, and yeah, it, it, I think it's important. And, and and a lot of philosophy too, especially in the vein of Plato, who saw the body as like this, um, and, and the body and physical desires as something we, we should, we, we have to strive to overcome as an impediment to, to um, genuine understanding and philosophy. So I like that notion, the finitude is important. Um, okay, the fourth conclusion is just creation. And here Levinas is rejecting the typical theological um, approach to creation, the relation between God and and the creature, the created, which he says is understood in terms of ontology. Why does he reject that? Because ontology aims to reconstitute a totality. It aims to overcome this this gap between the created and the creator and and um, see both fitting into into a, a a whole a total a totality the problem with that approach that kind of what levinas calls ontological approach is that it can't understand an infinite being somehow allowing something outside itself something truly separate from itself it has to it has to include the um the in, the infinite has to include the created the infinite has to include the, the finite in some way so it can't understand what, what's central to levinas here this notion of a, a finite that is necessarily separate from the infinite nor can it understand how the a free being can be connected to that infinite. It can't understand how a, a, a truly separate individual can yet have some connection to the finite, to the infinite. And that's because it's attempting to understand everything as a as a totality. That's what that's again that's that's what Levinas sees ontology as doing. So creation though for Levinas, he sees uh, his philosophy of exteriority, that transcendence, as the perfect example of creation. Why? Because of this absolute gap that Levinas insists on between the finite and the infinite, the, um, the separated being and the transcendent alterity. Uh, and why is that creation why does that result in creation because in the face-to-face -face encounter 
The I is neither subject nor object, nor are the two subsumed in a totality, the I and the other. Instead, their reciprocal exteriority proceeds as if from nothingness. So the other and I enter into this face-to-face in which the other, to me, is an infinite transcendent alterity. But I am also an infinite transcendent alterity for the other. And this reciprocal exteriority arises as if from nothingness, as if from as if by being created. Uh, and that's that's this that's what Levinas that's how Levinas understands creation and that's how well that's why he thinks his philosophy of exteriority is is the perfect example of creation. Cool. The uh, the fifth conclusion is exteriority and language. So the idea here is that, uh, and I, this is a good term, I like this term, common sense and philosophy, from Plato to Heidegger, he claims, are both panoramic. I like that. Panoramic. And it, by that he means the whole is being. And disclosure is its truth. The whole is being and disclosure is the truth of being. And so this is a panoramic approach. Levinas calls this panoramic because, um, well, being is everything and we are, we are disclosing it for ourselves. We are, we are seeking to understand the whole, the, to- the totality. We're, we're looking to, as if before a panorama, which we can take in in its entirety. So common sense and philosophy are both panoramic. But Levinas, um, for Levinas, however, this that's obviously not the case because we're dealing with a transcendent other, an other who is fundamentally ungraspable, who's, who's fundamentally beyond our apprehension. And yet, nevertheless, nevertheless, we're able to enter into relation with this other. And that relation, that relation with exteriority, is mediated by language, discourse. So truth, then, is produced such that I could not derive it from my own interiority. Truth comes from something external to me, from this this transcendent exteriority. Hence, Levinas calls this teaching, because it's something which I cannot come up with myself. I can't produce this from my own interiority. It must come from from an external perspective. So this then, Levinas' notion of truth here, resists thematization because the external being, the other, expresses itself. I can't thematize them. I can't define them. I can't wrap them up in any neat kind of concepts or or assign them qualities that would that would um, enclose their being they always resist they always transcend any um, concepts or qualities or definitions I might try and lock them up in so this account of exteriority and, and truth coming from that, um, resists thematization because the external being expresses itself. The external being is this fundamentally transcendent other, which by being fundamentally transcendent transcends any definitions or, or um, <clears throat> concepts or qualities I might try and lock them into. They are, they express themselves, and that expression is their transcendence, is their fundamental exteriority. So they, re, so um, it's, it's not something that I can, that I can define in any way. Uh, and that, that, that's what truth is, that, that's kind of um, 
an important aspect of truth that it is that it has a reference point outside me or else it's it's arbitrary it's not true it's not false it, it can't be said to be either because it, it's it, it's just arbitrary if i am the only um, source of truth then then truth doesn't actually exist so it's only through this exteriority this relation to the with exteriority mediated by language that truth can uh, be produced and uh, he also says that this this takes place um, when the manifestation and the manifested coincide so the the other and the appearance of the other the encounter with the other are one and the same that's what makes the other and the encounter with with them transcendent that's what makes them an an absolute exteriority um cool he compares this to vision um, which we've already talked about a little bit the way that um, in vision an external object is interiorized as an as an adequate idea it's thematized it's personal it's understood by concepts everything refers back to me <clears throat> that that's how vision operates and he brings heidegger in here by saying that um, something always manifests as something so that's heidegger's um, hermeneutical approach that interpretation everything appears as something but that's exactly the opposite of what Levinas is getting at here the other doesn't appear as anything they are fundamentally transcendent that they're beyond any any um, labels or definitions or any appearance even that we that we could try that we might try to understand them within that they're absolutely beyond comprehension um <clears throat> so that's the opposite that that's kind of the opposite of levinas's approach the speaker for levinas from from this um, transcendent alterity is present in their own speech they are in their discourse whereas in an image as in um, vision or as in heidegger's hermeneutical method the speaker is absent there is no speaker behind the image I, all i'm taking all i have is the image and i'm basing my uh, understanding on that and but the image always refers to me there's nothing there's nothing substantial, if you like, behind it. Whereas for Levinas, the speaker always being present in their own speech, it's that which which means that they appear as a transcendent alterity, as an absolute other. Uh, which which, and so that is how the other manifests to us through through language, through speech. The sixth conclusion uh, is expression and image. This is kind of covering territory, territory we've already looked at. Um, so he says expression overflows images. Language is always, speech is always um, more than, than the images we might use to try and understand that speech or capture that speech the face is never apprehended as an image or as an idea it always transcends uh, you know the image as in vision we talked about um, the image in, in relation to vision it always transcends an idea the definitions concepts we might try and apply to it um, and Levinas always also mentions here that works have meaning independent of the author We've talked about this in the video a few times as well. Levinas calls it an abyss between labor and language. So um, there's 
uh, I guess works is another way of of, of kind of um, another word for image here. It's something that stands apart from the the artist themselves, uh, and, and in doing so, is open then to interpretation. Is open to um, being understood or misunderstood. In, in however in whatever way we like but either way it's missing the the artists themselves themselves they're not there in they're not there to kind of justify to to support their their work once once um, a work is produced it, it is just in the fact of being produced it is separate from the its creator the author or the the painter or talking about works of art maybe but uh, but whatever however in the same way that an image is um, can't capture the other the face works also can't capture can't express the author and he, he compares this with um, politics and history as well and the same thing applies there humanity is always understood in those disciplines from works from actions from documents it's always understood as um, as things separate from the actual individuals behind them history is always a history of interchangeable people reciprocal relations there's nothing there's no genuine encounter there between one one individual and an infinite transcendent but between one individual and another basically because if you have that genuine um, encounter then one is the transcendent other one is an absolute alterity just by by virtue of what a human being is so it's kind of i mean that there's just we're, we're retreading the same ground there in that in that conclusion i think the seventh conclusion against the philosophy of the neuter so the neuter here is basically levinas's word for impersonal the impersonal so he references heidegger's impersonal being and hegel's impersonal reason uh, and that's obviously exactly what levinas is, is it's the opposite of Levinas's philosophy. He insists instead on the I in the separation of enjoyment um, as being central. We, we can't dispense with that I, with that <clears throat> that uh, separated I, which I've already talked about. Right? We must have that subjective field of truth um, because without that, exteriority doesn't doesn't make any sense so he's completely against this this notion of of the impersonal and materialism he says is actually not a consequence of focusing on the sensible and maybe an overly an overly um it's not a, it's not a function of focusing too much on the on the sensible rather it's the loss of the personal it's, it's a loss of the i um, which means that it's it's embracing this idea of what levinas calls the neuter the impersonal okay eight subjectivity so uh basically in this from this little section i i got two things there are two aspects to subjectivity the first is that we are originally separated in happiness or enjoyment that's how we described it this is um, atheism and the second aspect is that this um, separation is still directed towards transcendence the finite has the idea of infinity and uh, the separation and the relationship with the other are produced simultaneously. There is um, th the the separation is is 
what it is to be separated, what it is to be finite, is to be this opening to the infinite, to the other. Uh, and I quite like that. Separation and relationship with the other are produced simultaneously. It's not, it's not the case that there is this separation, this isolation, this finitude, and then somehow um, as something extra or as something additional, infinite, the, the, um, the, uh, the infinite uh, appears, manifests before us. The, 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 the relation between finite and infinite, between separated and this uh, desire, metaphysical desire, is the same. They are the same thing. Two sides of the same coin, if you like. And this is what Levinas calls intentionality. Intentionality is not Husserl's noesis, noema structure. It's not the intentionality of a separated eye towards other objects. Intentionality for Levinas is connected with his idea of exteriority. It's a going beyond. It's a it's a um, it's it's metaphysical desire, desire that that doesn't arise from a lack. So both of these aspects are essential for subjectivity, um, and that's different from what we normally think because we usually think of subjectivity as kind of just maybe maybe just that first part wrapped up in itself. Things are things appear to me for me. Uh, you know, wrapped up in, in our own kind of self-consciousnesses. But, uh, but for Levinas, it, it, an essential part of subjectivity is this metaphysical desire, capital D desire. Okay, um, man, I've forgotten what number we're up to. I think nine. I think nine. The maintenance of subjectivity. So this is fundamentally about the state uh, he talks about the state or we, this, this uh, notion of a collectivity. The state arises when the face of the other relates us with a third party. And so we're getting into this idea of universality here. We're getting into this the sense that um, we, are, we are a part of this, of a greater whole. And this deforms the I because it judges us according to universal rules. That is to say, it judges us in absentia. We are not present for these. We are not, we're not treated as an individual, as a separate, um, legitimate individual. We're treated as part of a whole. We're, we're, we, we lose our individuality. Um, and that's that, that subjectivity. That, that sense of individuality is important, as we've seen, because without that, there's no exteriority. Um, but to resist, to resist this um, temptation, or that's maybe not the right word, but to resist this this um, collectivity, to resist this being sucked into the into the into a totality, to resist it in the name of subjectivity would fail, Levinas thinks, because Hegelian universalism would would trump that, would would overcome. If we were just saying, if we just wanted to say, I'm an individual in my own right, um, you know, don't 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 force me to to submit to these universal rules that apply to everyone equally all the time. Um, I, I'm an individual in my own right. That's not going to work. Levinas thinks against a Hegelian type universalism, because in though in that case, subjective events are just lost. It's a nice expression in the sands of interiority. They just it's like okay, you're an individual, you're an interior, you're, you're an interiority, but that that subjectivity is is purely wrapped up in your own little world, in your own isolated corner. Uh, the 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 state, the whole, the we, is takes precedence, um, and so I think Levinas sees that as as not being the way to resist that um, call to community, if you like. Rather, 
Levinas supposes it with fecundity. And in this, and this is how he maintains subjectivity in the face of, of a uh, totalizing force. Infinite time here um, opens up now. So the subject persists through an I which is other. And that is, is how Levinas sees subjectivity being maintained um, in a way that, that doesn't just appeal to, to my own subjectivity. Subjectivity is maintained through this, through fecundity because it opens up. It, I transcend my limited subjectivity. Uh, and, and in doing so, I infinitize my subjectivity, if you like. It, it persists through this, through the child, which is which is I, but also other. So that's cool. Then uh, the tenth conclusion, beyond being. And uh, basically, there isn't too much to say about this. Since exteriority cannot be thematized, then um, exteriority, or the, the, the goal here, can't be a caring for being. And that's another reference to Heidegger. We can't, it can't be about caring for being because um, exteriority, which is being, is fundamentally beyond our care. It's, it's infinite. It's, it's absolutely transcendent. We can't cash this out in terms of care. And, um, and since existence goes beyond the totality, beyond the, um, or beyond the totality to the exteriority, that's, that's the sense in which I think Levinas is trying to say here that his philosophy is going beyond being. It's beyond being understood as a totality. Uh, it's again moving into that exteriority. Just about everything in this centered on that that idea of the exteriority, the importance of exteriority, the idea that being is exteriority. All right, the eleventh conclusion is freedom invested, and here Levinas talks about freedom being the event of separation, right? The I. But an event, a separation, which at the same time maintains a relation with exteriority. So always bearing that, that in mind. Any other conception, he says, of freedom would dissolve freedom. It would dissolve it into either a multiplicity of beings in a rational system. So you lose your freedom. In that, in that case, because you become part of this totality. Or freedom would be lost because um, you would be submitted to the violence of being outside any system if you maintained your own arbitrary freedom. Then an arbitrary freedom is not freedom for Levinas. Levinas arises only in those... With, with those two criteria, the event of separation, but a separation that maintains a relation with exteriority at the same time. And this means that um, freedom must be justified. It can't just be a reference. It can't be arbitrary. It can't just, my freedom can't just turn on, on myself. It can't be centered on my own existence. That's not freedom. Um, and so, and what Levinas, to capture that idea, Levinas says here, freedom must be justified. If freedom justified itself, then any finitude would render that freedom absurd. And so he, he says that with Heidegger, what you get is thrownness, which is, which is a finite freedom. But any finitude, if, if freedom is, is justifying itself, is called on to justify itself, then any finitude makes it, makes it a mockery of the term, because then it's not free. So thrownness 
turns Heidegger's um, freedom into, into an absurdity. And he says the same for Sartre. Any in encounter with the other cancels my freedom because they, they, they appear as a subject and I, I'm reduced to an object um, and the subject is free. So I become just, just a tool, an instrument. Again, freedom is rendered absurd there, he, uh, Levinas says. The presence of the other, for Levinas, questions my freedom, not as freedom itself, but it questions its arbitrariness. And, um, and in doing so, justifies freedom. In doing so, allows my freedom to be justified. The irrationality of freedom, Levinas says, is this arbitrariness. If freedom is, is left to stand on its own, to justify itself, it's arbitrary, it's irrational. Um, that's what's irrational about freedom. Not that it be limited, but that it be arbitrary. And so Levinas, with the other, with the, the notion that freedom must be invested, it must be justified, is attempting to ground freedom in in a way that makes it legitimate. And that's what that's what the presence of the other does, questioning my freedom. Uh, and he also says, and this was kind of interesting um, and a little bit confusing, he says, doesn't this justification, justifying freedom, doesn't this itself need to be justified if we're, if we're going to attain certainty here? And he says, yes, it would, if we were after certainty. If we were looking for certainty, then we'd have to justify the justification. Um, but we're not after certainty. Moral justification of freedom is beyond certitude and incertitude. Because the ethical is the structure of exteriority as such. The ethical is that encounter with exteriority, that face-to-face. -face. Um, and this, is, this has nothing to do with certain or, or, or uncertain or even truth or false, falsehood. It's beyond that. It's, it's prior to that. It's what grounds all of those things. And that's why Levinas says morality is first philosophy. It's not a branch of philosophy. I quite like that, morality's first philosophy. And that only makes sense in Levinas's philosophy because he his understanding of morality obviously is that face-to-face, -face, the relation with the transcendent other. Um, but because that, that relation is so central, everything flows from it for Levinas, um, then that as morality or ethics becomes first philosophy, not just another branch. Nice. And the last conclusion, peace. So in this section, metaphysics, under, or Levinas talks about the way metaphysics understands the production of being as goodness in that face-to-face -face encounter. And it's beyond happiness, beyond happiness, beyond enjoyment, because that is that, that's the the separated eye, the eye in atheism. However, this this idea of metaphysics has nothing to do with the collective totality, obviously. Rather, it begins from the eye, begins from that subjective field of truth. I keep coming back to that term because it's a nice one. Um, so it starts from there, and he he talks about Kierkegaard here, uh, and that in the sense that metaphysics is not a Kierkegaardian type desire for happiness or salvation. Um, it's not an isolated eye tending towards a beyond, aiming towards this a, a greater eternal happiness or salvation. That's not what Levinas has in mind. Because, again, it's transcendent. It's fundamentally other. There is no way in which, if the eye were to be subsumed in this infinity, then it wouldn't be eye anymore. There would be no exteriority. And that would, that would mean the eradication of everything. Truth, being, everything is lost with that. 
So the eye must respect the alterity of the beyond that it encounters. And it's this which gives rise to the plurality, which is a set so essential for Levinas. Uh, and he talks about then this, so you've got this relation, the eye and the other, the harmony in which the separated eye establishes a relation with the transcendent other is what Levinas calls peace. And that's a nice, nice place to, to kind of bring us, I think, that, that harmony in this, the relation between the separated eye and the transcendent other, peace. Nice. And this is the last point. This is ultimately concretized in the family. Uh, which Levinas describes or defines as the instant of eroticism and the infinity of paternity are conjoined. When those two come together, then you get the family, and that's the ultimate um, concretization of this, this relation with the transcendent other. Nice. That's cool. So the, the summary today is, is kind of, I debated about whether to even have one because the whole conclusion section is basically a summary, right, of Levinas's book. Um, and so to add a summary on top of that is like a summary of a summary. But um, I don't know, I thought I'd do it. You can skip it if you like. I'm just going to go through each point, each, each conclusion, and just kind of put up um, one or two of, of the most important things I think that what I think are the most important things that we discussed today. So first we looked at from the like to the same. Here the idea identity doesn't derive from, from being like to itself, which requires an external perspective. Um, rather identity comes from being the same, from identifying oneself from within. The second conclusion being is exteriority. So being is neither object nor subject centered. So we're, we're getting away from this idea that um, being is, is in objects themselves and the idea that being is might be in the subject. Rather, for Levinas, being is exterior to, to, to everything. It's exterior to both. Being is, is in that transcendence. And the truth of being arises from the subjective field of truth. We need to have that subjective, that separated subjectivity in order for the truth of being to, um, to manifest. Then the finite and the infinite. Basically, metaphysics here is a relation between the finite and the infinite. That's the summary of Levinas's whole book. And finitude was neither a longing for infinity nor negative. Infinite finitude was that opening to infinity at the same time. The two, the two can't be separated. The next creation, so there was a rejection of theology here, which um, Levinas saw as being ontological, as subsuming everything into a totality. Creation takes place rather for Levinas in the face-to-face. -face. There's a um, the way that that reciprocal exteriority proceeds as if from nothingness. And that's what makes, that's, that, that is creation right there. That the idea that um, the exteriority proceeds, arises as if from nothing, as if it's being created from nothing. Exteriority and language. So the relation with exteriority is mediated by language. We looked at teaching, how this is teaching, because it's something which cannot come from the interiority, cannot come from me. And the importance of the speaker being present in their own speech. And we contrasted this with the image, which always refers to um, to me, to the subject. Uh, but but. It, while it refers to me as the viewing subject, it um, is distant, is divorced from the actual, from, from what the image is supposed to represent. Because the speaker is only present in their speech. Anything else, any of their works, any images, any ideas, 
serve to separate the speaker from from the image. Then expression and image. Expression always overflows the image for the reasons I just said. And we looked at the we talked about the abyss between labor or works and language. Then against the philosophy of the neuter. And basically this was just against the impersonal. Levinas insists that we must have that personal, that subjectivity is, is necessary for the relation with the other. And then subjectivity. Two aspects to subjectivity. The first is that is being separated in happiness or enjoyment. And the second aspect is how we're directed towards transcendence, that metaphysical desire. The next, the maintenance of subjectivity, this was related, relating to the state. The state deforms the eye by judging the individual according to universal rules. It, it, um, it doesn't respect the subjectivity of the eye. It, it reduces the eye to just one among many, to um, a, an interchangeable individual which is to say not an individual. Um, and Levinas recommends opposing the totalizing power of the state, not through appeal to this arbitrary subjectivity, but through fecundity. Then we looked at beyond being, and this is just going beyond the totality. That That's how, I mean, that's the core idea of Levinas's philosophy, right? Freedom invested was the 11th conclusion. Um, freedom in the eye, the separated eye, is arbitrary. It's only, and freedom always then requires a justification. And it can only be justified when the other questions my freedom, when the other approaches me from that, uh, from that infinite distance and calls my freedom into question. And it's that which rather far from eliminating my freedom, invests it. It, 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 make, it justifies it. It makes it genuine. Um, and so that was the importance of, of that, that notion, freedom invested. And finally, peace. So when the separated eye, this, what peace is, what, arise, what happens when the separated eye establishes a relation with a transcendent other. That's just what Levinas calls that relation. And finally, um, peace is ultimately concretized in the family. Eros plus paternity or fecundity, maybe. Nice. Okay, cool. So we're done. That is totality and infinity. Like I said, there's one more video I'm going to do of a video for the preface um, but but the bulk is, is the bulk of the books done if you've stuck with me through through this series um, thank you it's good to have you along for the ride um, I think Levinas is, is interesting he's interesting in his own right uh, his philosophy and and I think he, he's he has found or he found something um, he carved a little niche for himself, I think, with a with a with this this notion of the other um, and his completely different take on it from his from his um, contemporaries, you know, Sartre and Loi Ponty, and, and and following on from Heidegger. But um, but I think it's it's a it's a good philosophy, despite my frequent frequent rants about <laughs> his importation of some of his religious stuff into 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 his philosophy i think that there's a solid um it, it's it's a good book to have read i think a good book to have read and understood anyway enough ranting enough enough not ranting i'm babbling that's what i'm doing here let me call it thanks for sticking with me through this there's one more video to come but if you don't watch that i'll understand and um yeah, I'll see you in the next series. I don't even know what I'm going to do next, so I'll have to wait and see. Anyway, see you then.